Hi there, you're listening to the Gospel Doctor Podcast, and I'm your host, Prince John, and my goal is to provide nuggets of the Word that will make the body of Christ operate in full potential. Hello, welcome back. You are listening to the series on David and Goliath, named The Road of a Warrior. Now, this is the third part of our series, and it is titled Covenant Relationship. Now, this is going to be really exciting. First, uh, let's read 1 Samuel 17, verse 37 from the New American Standard Bible. So, let's read it. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Now let me give a quick synopsis of what's happening. Now David accepts Goliath's challenge and he goes to Saul, King Saul, and he says that he wants to fight Goliath. Now the King Saul looks at David and he just sees a boy who wants to fight this great warrior. Now, and he naturally says, you're not able to go and fight against this Philistine. You are just a boy. You're just a youth. That's what he says. While this guy has been a warrior since his youth. Now, or loosely translated, Saul was saying, yeah, right. You will fight him, huh? (laughs) Then David says something so amazing. He says that the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. I think Saul would have been, um, (laughs) yeah, good one. You're you're serious, aren't you? You know, I, I can see his expressions changing. What on earth is this guy talking about? Now, if a modern day Christian would have been near David at that point, I'm pretty sure he would have tried to be religious or at least sound religious. And he would have told him, <clears throat> uh, what my friend David uh, is trying to say here is that if it's God's will, he will fight Goliath and win. May the Lord's will be done. He would have pulled him to the side and told him, David, 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 come back to your senses. What are you doing? You can't say, just walk in here and say that you're going to kill this Philistine. How would it look like if you don't? Do you even know if it's God's will for you? Let's let's fast and pray for a few days before we know if it's God's will for you that you should fight Goliath. And let's decide. And moreover, if you think about it, David does not have to fight Goliath to be a king. He has been anointed a king. So he doesn't really have to prove anything. Now, we have been so advanced in theological understanding that now we decide the will of God by the outcome. But what made David do all that? Like David was saying in the beginning itself, the Lord will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Remember, it's not a modern day society where you say something and you change your mind and everything's, everybody's okay with it. But it's a society where where your words mattered. Now, if David said that, and if he didn't come through, or if he was defeated, do you think he will be accepted in the eyes of the people after that? It will be too hard for them to accept. He, He would have, so he would have measured his words carefully. So David would have known what he was saying. He would have meant every word of it. Now, did David know something that we didn't know? Now, why did David have so much of confidence and we don't have that much confidence? Now, to give a very short answer, David believed in the covenant. Now, what is a covenant? For those of you who don't know what a covenant is, a covenant is a solemn binding agreement or a contract. Like, it's, uh, we, it is the closest we can relate to these days as a contract. But co- covenants were conditional or unconditional. A conditional covenant simply meant that the covenant would be fulfilled if the conditions were met. For example, a company, uh, if they tried to hire a contractor to construct an office building for a certain amount of money, they would expect the contractor to complete the work before the payment, right? But if the contractor 
fails to complete the building, as laid out in the contract agreement, the company can withhold the payment, right? So that's a conditional covenant. Then that's a conditional contract, but something similar is a conditional covenant. On the other hand, there are unconditional covenants as well, in which it does not involve any condition, any stipulations, or of any kind. An example from today's world would be a person who wills his property to another person in a will or a testament, with no conditions、uh, needing to be fulfilled by the recipient to receive the money or the property. So that's an unconditional covenant where there are no conditions whatsoever. To understand what covenant David was alluding to, we should look into the covenants that were in progress at the time when David was talking about this. Right? That would be the right way to approach this. Now, Bible scholars generally agree that there were four covenants between God and man, which would relate to David at this point in time, in one way or the other. Now, without getting into details, I'll list them. There was the Edenic covenant, the Noahic covenant between God and Noah, then the Abrahamic covenant, and the Mosaic covenant. Now, the first two does not have a lot to do with David and his war with Goliath, even though that's a, these are significant covenants. But has nothing which David can use for the war with Goliath. However, with Abraham, it was a different story. It was an unconditional covenant. It's it's an interesting covenant. If you read Genesis twelve two to three, it says that I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now there was no condition in the covenant. We don't see anything, nothing which Abraham had to do. Now that's when things get interesting. There are some people who say that. These are for eternal blessings and not about any blessing on earth. But just have a look yourself. It is about earth, mainly. There's spiritual blessings as well. It says, "Great nation, blessing those who bless you. All the families of the earth shall be blessed." Now you tell me if this pertains to heaven or earth. Now let's move on. There is one more covenant which pertain to David. The Mosaic Covenant. Now, the Mosaic Covenant, unlike the Abrahamic Covenant, was a conditional agreement between God and the people of Israel that was mediated by Moses. Exodus nineteen to twenty-four is where you can read them. The people of Israel had to fulfill God's conditions in this covenant to stay and prosper in the land God had given them. So it was at very clearly written. Conditions which the people of Israel had to fulfill. Now, none of the Israelites were ever pure before God、uh, through the keeping of this covenant, because it was impossible for anyone to obey it perfectly. Now, it was just impossible because of sin. Now, the million-dollar question is this: Which covenant was David showing confidence in? Now David couldn't have been very confident in the Mosaic covenant, right? Because I just like I said just now, the Bible says in Romans three twenty three twenty four, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That includes David too. That means it is impossible for David to say that he is confident based on the Old Testament covenant, covenant or the Mosaic covenant. But he knows it is an amazing covenant, mind you. David knows this. That is why in Psalm 119, verse 34, he says to teach him to keep the law, because David knows that if he can keep that law, it is outstanding and such a great blessing. So, which covenant was it? So, which covenant covenant was David referring to? It should have been the Abrahamic covenant. Now we saw that the Abrahamic covenant was unconditional. And hence, David did not really have any conditions to fulfill from his end, right? But and there is another clue to show you that this was the Abrahamic covenant. Now listen closely to what David says in First Samuel seventeen verse twenty-six. He asks, "Who is this uncircumcised Philistine 
who is challenging the armies of the living God. Now, is David just blabbering stuff? Now, he did, was not blabbering stuff, because in Genesis chapter seventeen, verse eleven, God had said to Abraham that the circumcision shall be the sign of the covenant between God and Abraham's descendants. You can read for yourself Genesis seventeen eleven. The circumcision was the sign of a covenant. So when David said, "Who is this uncircumcised Philistine?" he was referring to the fact that this guy did not have the covenant, does not have the covenant, and I do have the covenant. He was referring to that. He knew exactly what he was talking about. He knew that he was referring to the Abrahamic covenant. Now David knew that God would bless those who bless him, and that God would curse. Those who curse him, according to Genesis twelve three. So there goes David, trusting in the Abrahamic covenant and ready to fight Goliath. So let me ask you something: Were the other soldiers part of the covenant too? Yes, they should have been, right? But they did not believe that they were, and hence it was of no use, right? Now you might be thinking. Awesome, good for David. That's a great covenant. But Prince, I don't see what's the point of all this because、um, David had a covenant with God, and that was because he was an Israelite. And、uh, so we are not Israelites. So how is it applicable for us? Now let me ask you a question: Would it be great if we had such a covenant? I'm pretty sure you will say yes, of course. Now, what if I tell you that we have that? Covenant and even more. I'm pretty sure you might be like, "Dude, how many times should I tell you we're not Israel?" Well, you are going to be surprised. Now, let me ask you a question: Was there any condition of being in the Abrahamic covenant? Nothing, right? Except that the person should have been an Israelite or Abraham's descendant, right? Because that is how David used the covenant. Now, what if I say that you are, and listen carefully, that you are an Israelite? What if I say that? Now, before you think I'm crazy, now let's go to Romans nine verse three to eight and have a look at what I'm talking about. Now, Romans nine verse three to eight. Now, Paul says, "For I wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ." For the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons, and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, who are the fathers, and from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed for ever. But it is as it is not as though the word of God had failed, for they are not. All Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. Whoa! Now Paul is saying that the covenant and the promise belong to Israel. Now he is、uh, in the beginning. He's very sad. He's saying that the covenant and the promise belong to Israel,、uh, and he says that Israel has not been blessed completely. Now this is something which we know already because when we have a have look at everything and how Israel is right now, we can see some blessings, but they're not completely blessed, according to the Abrahamic covenant. But the Abrahamic covenant said that they will be blessed completely, right? Now. Did they miss something?、Uh, is there something which they didn't do? It couldn't have been because it was an unconditional covenant. And now, if the only condition was that the person should have been born an Israelite, we should see every Israelite blessed. So, did God fail in His word? Because we don't see all Israelites blessed. Now, I'm pretty sure believers will never ask these kind of questions. But it seems like unbelievers will ask these kind of questions because they take the word more literally than we do. They believe in every word of it more than we do. 
But the but the believers, as believers, we are trained not to ask questions most of the time. So if you ask a question most of the time, I've heard pastors say, "Why do you need to ask such a question?" I'm not saying every pastor is like that, but I've said I'm just saying I've heard pastors say that. Now, Paul stresses that God's word did not fail. So did we miss out on something? Is there something which we are not seeing? He also, Paul also drops the bombshell, and he says in verse six to eight, "For they are not all Israel." Who are not who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they're Abraham's descendants. But he says that that is it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are considered to be descendants. Oh my God! So who are the children of the promise? He says it very clearly. It is not the children. Of the flesh, but children of the promise. Who are the children of the promise? Now this is getting really exciting. Let's move to Galatians four, verse twenty-eight, and you will see who it is. And you, brethren, let's say it together. And you, brethren, like Isaac, are the children of the promise. I didn't add it in the Bible. It's already there. You are the children of the promise. That means we are the children of the promise once you're born again. Wow, this is amazing. Now, if you're still not convinced, let's read Galatians three verse twenty-nine. Galatians three verse twenty-nine, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. Which promise is he talking about? He's definitely talking about the Abrahamic covenant, right? Abrahamic promise. Man, this is amazing! It gives me goosebumps. Now, when I when I saw this the first time, I was so joyful and thankful to the Lord for all His wonderful blessings. And I I I still wonder why it is not being preached that often. I hear a lot of people complaining that we are not preaching the judgment of God. But in Romans, it says that people come to repentance through the goodness of God. We should preach the goodness of God more often. You are an heir according to the promise. You inherit the blessings of Abraham. Now, this is just by plain reading. That will do. Now, if you're starting to see it, let me explain what happened to the best of my ability by the grace of God. So, let me ask you something. When we are born again, where are we now? Now, Colossians three three says that your life is hidden with God. That is, you are in Christ. That is a term which has been used over and over and over again. But we need to understand it is. It means that we are in Christ. Exactly what it means. Exactly how it says. That's how what it means. We are in Christ. So if you are in Christ and Christ is the seed of Abraham, if Christ is blessed and we are in Christ, aren't we blessed as well? We are blessed. You will see this throughout the Bible. God has been saying this over and over again, but we are not getting this. We are missing out on this. Now look at the Passover. You'll see that God only looked for the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of where they stayed. Right? That was the only thing which He was looking for. And where was the blood? It was outside. And who was blessed because of that? Those who were inside. So, because of Christ, and we are in Christ, we are blessed in Christ by the Abrahamic covenant. But there is more to it. We will see in the coming episodes. But there is so much more. Now, look at the implications. Just by the Abrahamic covenant, what are the implications of Abrahamic covenant in your life? Now, let's read Genesis twelve two onwards, like you believe it. It says. I will make you into a great nation. Now, in Genesis seventeen verse four, God makes it very clear that Abraham will be the father of multitude of nations. So, my dear brother, my dear sister, if the doctor says that you're unable to, that you will not be able to have children, would you believe in the doctor, or will you, will you believe in the covenant of God that He said that He will make you into a father or a mother of great nations? Or a multitude of nations. What will you believe? 
Now, or are you going to listen to somebody else's teaching that God is trying to teach you patience, but not by not giving your children? It makes me so mad when I hear such kind of sermons that God has a purpose behind that. That, that God is trying to do something amazing in your life by not letting you have children, though he promised. Now, to illustrate this, let's read from Mark 9, verse 17. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has been robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Now, there is this, this incident, which is a very significant incident to illustrate my point. Now, if you see that the disciples were given the authority to cast out demons, to, do, to complete the healing, everything, they were given the authority, but they were not able to do it. So, if the disciples were not able to do it, what would in today's world, if a, if a leader was not able to do it, what would be the conclusion that it is not God's will? Now, when the disciples, when, now did Jesus say in verse 19, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that usually happens because, you know, God wanted my, me to heal the person, not you guys. That's not what happened. Now, very clearly, Jesus gets, gets really angry and he says, You unbelieving generation, how long shall I stay with you? How, shall, how long shall I put up with you? These are strong words. Bring the boy to me and he heals the boy. Now, I believe that this, one of the saddest things that will happen to believers is that they will go to heaven and they will realize that they have lived way below their privileges. Now, they will understand that the covenant was there, the blessing was there, but they chose, but they lived way, way, way be below their privileges. They chose to doubt. They chose to doubt. That's what they will be so sad about. The Bible says in Genesis 12 too, I will make you into a great nation. So if some person says to you, no matter who it is, if some person tells you that God wants to teach you something by not giving your children, tell them the God, the Lord of Abraham, the God of Abraham uh, has promised me through the Abrahamic covenant that I will have children. Now it's in the new covenant, it's even more, but we will come to that later. But we, this is an ultimate truth that you have so many blessings. It says again in verse the next verse that I will make your name great. Your name is great. So you don't have to have lack of confidence. You don't have to be depressed. You don't have to think that you're lonely because your name is great. And of course, God's name is greater, but your name is great as well. And it says, I will make you, I mean, if you read that once again, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. You are a blessing in every way. Physically, you're a blessing. Spiritually, you're a blessing. If you don't accept the fact that you're a blessing and keep saying that God wants me to be poor so that I will stay humble, then you are missing out on opportunities to bless other people. You are, the covenant was given so that you will be a blessing to whoever you are. So if you live below your privileges, you are not opening, it, opening the blessings which should have come through you to the people around you. Now, David knew about the great blessings that he was available through the Abrahamic covenant, and he was able to take advantage of that. But what about you? Are you able to live according to the promises? Are you able to, is the promises of God, apart from the salvation, are the promises of God visible in your life? Now, I'm not belittling salvation. If it was the only thing God had given, that would have been amazing. But God has given us even more. God has given us even more in Christ. However, in today's modern pop theology, the emphasis is, to, is made to doubt in God's covenant for you. Now, many people say that, uh, you know, we're not sure about what God's will is. But he might not do it because you have not been a good person. 
or he wants to teach you something. A lot of Christians these days are full of doubt that if someone says that God will heal 99 out of out of 100 people, then you will think, oh, probably, probably that one person, it's me. Dear brother and sister, you are a blessing. You need to realize that quickly. We, but what we see in this world is more and more people who start thinking that they are not a blessing. They start believing in the false doctrines and that they, they choose to be poor. They choose to remain sick. And they say that like, like Job, like Paul's thorn, God is trying to teach me something. This is so ridiculous. Now read the word with an open mind and you will see that God will reveal it to you. God will reveal his heart. You know, John 10.10 10 says, I keep saying this more and more, a lot of times, John 10.10 10 says that the thief key comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. And yet, when somebody gets so rich, we say, oh, that's from the devil. And if somebody's poor, we say, that's from God. I have heard with my own ears all this. And yet the Bible says in John 10.10, 10, the, the thief comes only, only, don't miss out on that only, to steal, kill, and destroy. And God, and in James, it says that every perfect gift is from God. Every perfect gift. Now, you're talking about, about a God who knows only to love you with all his heart. He gave his only son for you and he did not withhold anything. Now think about the prodigal son. He just came back. He wanted, he wanted just to eat. He just wanted to be a servant. But the prodigal son, which shows the father's love, he went above and beyond and he, he put the best party ever. He partied over there. He put him, uh, gave him a robe, put on a ring. He did everything. That's the kind of God you're talking. That's my God. That's your God. So next time when a financial crisis happens, you'll say, my family and I are blessed. We are not dependent on the economy. Next time a virus outbreak happens, you will say, I'm not dependent on what happens in society. I am dependent on the grace of God upon me and I'm blessed and I will be a blessing to everyone around me. And when someone says that you cannot have a baby and God is trying to teach you something, tell them that God has promised me a baby. God loves you so much. Don't, don't actually miss out on that. Don't get to heaven to finally realize that. Realize it now and don't live way below your privileges because God loves you so much. In the next episode, we will see that God has blessed us even more than that. He's gone above and beyond. If, we, if it was just the salvation, it would have still been enough. He made us part of the Abrahamic covenant. He has made us part of even more. You will be surprised and amazed to know what all we have been part of.